What's up everybody? Jody here with the Bass Nerds. Uh, just want to let you know who we are featuring this week in our podcast and that is Kevin Scott. Kevin Scott's a really talented bass player, even better human being. Um, you may have seen him touring with uh, Fork or Jimmy Herring. Uh, he also plays with Wednesday Night Titans, which is a the, <laughs> the duo where they take old wrestling promos and uh, like wwf wrestling promos and like chop them up put music to them it's a really fun interesting uh concept definitely check out their instagram page and their uh youtube just google search wednesday night titans you'll find their stuff uh kevin scott also performs with uh wax paper uh wayne krantz and uh uh also was playing with uh, Colonel Bruce Hampton before he passed. Um, really talented bass player. Bass currently uh, out in New Orleans, but offering lessons remotely, recording remotely. So if you need some uh, some bass play bass tracks on your stuff, definitely reach out to uh, Kevin Scott. His email is kscott26 at gmail. I'll put a little flashy thing here and link it probably down below kscott26 at gmail uh definitely has a very entertaining instagram page which is uh his ig is uh the kings with an s i king's eye the king's eye um check out follow his instagram page also his website kevinscottmusic.com um so before you get into we get into the podcast this week uh just want to let everybody know this was recorded uh on super bowl sunday uh so we typically shoot in our studio at where i'm currently at right now uh but we decided to do it remotely at mark's place so uh you know a little more diy video quality might not be as good but i think it's still a great podcast uh we had a really fun time and this was obviously shot before uh our current quarantine and everything like that um also we have some really big changes coming for the bass nerds um we have a new studio location where we'll be recording out of um that is just beautiful and a pretty big step up from what we've been recording at uh we also have another podcast we'll re that we'll be releasing next week that was recorded pre pandemic where we will uh i don't want to give away who it is but it's a, a fairly well-known bass builder builder who does very few if any interviews uh and he was kind enough to give us a bass to give away and uh so we'll be doing a pretty big bass giveaway here this is not some like squire j bass we're giving away this is a really nice high quality instrument that uh would be great in anybody's arsenal um not to hate on squires I'm just, they make some good instruments too uh but this is definitely a bit nicer uh and we'll be giving that away so you'll be make sure like if you want a chance to win that bass uh make sure you like subscribe to our stuff follow us on uh apple itunes and then i think in about a week we'll be releasing that podcast with uh instructions on how to enter to win that bass super excited for it it's a really beautiful it's so beautiful you're going to want to win this base. Uh, so outside of that, I hope everybody's staying safe and uh, social distancing and taking care of everyone's doing hopefully all right. And um, I, we've got a couple more uh, interviews in the can that we'll be releasing over the next few weeks. So um, we've got lots more content to share with you guys and other big news that I, I can't quite share yet, but like some pretty big things are happening with the base nerds. And uh, Mark and I are both very excited for it. Um, so I hope you like Kevin Scott and our interview with him. Like I said, be sure to follow him. Uh, if you, if you need some bass tracking or some lessons, kscott26 at gmail, uh, or kevinscottmusic.com. Uh, hope you like the podcast. We'll see you soon. Um, so, uh, we're the bass nerds. I am Jody. And I'm Mark. And we're here with our good friend, Kevin Scott, the King's Eye. <sighs> yeah. As he's known on Instagram, uh, so tell us a little bit more about yourself, who you play with, the projects you've got going on, why the hell you're in Chicago <laughs> shotgunning White Claws with me. Yeah, check out our Instagram for that sweet, sweet <laughs> video. <laughs> well, I did it wrong, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've uh, worked in Atlanta, Georgia for 14 years. I uh, worked with Cobra's Hampton and uh, 
with Bruce that transitioned me to I worked with this guy Jimmy Herring, this guitar player, this, and oh yeah, bad motherfucker. Yeah. And some New York guys, Wayne Krantz a lot. It's a great guitar player. Yeah, and, uh, Brian McCaslin every now and then, and this uh, band called Fork <coughs> with a Q, with a Q, with, Q. Mm-hmm. with Henry Hay, and so it is Fork. Fork. It is Fork. Yes, and uh, and then me and, this, me and these guys at Danziger have this project called Wednesday Night Titans. That shit. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Tell 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 people a little bit about Wednesday Night Titans. Well, it's a I guess it's like a visual audio experience based around uh, 70s and 80s pro wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're big, you and, and the drummer Zach, yes, right? Yeah. You guys are big wrestling fans. Well, it's, I mean Zach was. I mean Zach was at the I think the first WrestleMania at Madison Square Garden. Wow. He was there. And I think he went to the second one as well. But uh, I'm I still follow it pretty regularly. Yeah, I, never, I, I grew out of it for a few years. I got back into it pretty heavy about four years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, but me and Zach <clears throat> were on tour with Wayne Krantz, and we both realized we're wrestling fans. Um, I wish we somebody would have taped that moment. Like, yeah. Hey, it's, it's, wait a minute. Yeah, you make some weird, obscure reference, and he knows exactly what you're talking about. I mean, he knows more. <laughs> I thought I knew a lot about A's wrestling, but Zach knows everything. Yeah. It's pretty, all, all the obscure jobbers and, and you know, announcers and all this yeah. stuff. But, um, so, yeah, so we, we talked about it there, and then he came to Atlanta for a, a week to write, and then my buddy Brett, we recorded some music, and then I suggested putting pro wrestling interviews over the top and doing, like, trap auto-tune music but with wrestling interviews because they're always so rhythmic and crazy right yeah and they're like the old like ultimate warrior ones and oh, randy man. savage yeah just, the one of him just randy savage just breathing that video oh god <laughs> <laughs> what's that called though there's a whole series of it's called no words or something yeah that is just the, just the breaths right i mean it can i mean if you're anxiety prone it can, it can probably like Oh uh, yeah, put someone in the hospital. Oh for sure, <laughs> <laughs> so extreme. You know? Yeah, I, you know, I, I have yet to see you guys live, but I've been following you all since the moment you posted your first video. Um, in addition to like the really funny sketch videos that we'll talk about in a little oh, bit. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the uh, as soon as you posted that, I was like, oh man, this dude, this guy gets it. <laughs> he like, totally gets it. I think that was like right before I met you at the at the shop. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I mean, essentially, I met you when I was out with Wayne, which was like two or three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, so Zach, I made that little suggestion, and then Zach sent me a track with Jimmy, a Jimmy Snooker interview, and then, of course, because Zach is a super genius, he comes up with the entire concept of doing the video with uh, Yeah, I mean, like, audio. Well, how, how would you, so you describe it as trap? No, it, not now. Not now. But the, the original my, idea was original today. was because it was like that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, like have like this kind of like you know, I guess like modern hip hop trap. Yeah, yeah. But have wrestling interviews <laughs> instead of being like rappers. <laughs> awesome. Obviously, wrestler wrestlers influence a lot of rappers. Sure, you know, Ric Flair sure. especially. But, right. Um, so yeah, so he basically called me. and It's like, well, I booked a gig. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. So it's like I sent some songs over to him. He had some songs. Because, you know, Zach had that project called Edit Bunker with Owen mm. Biddle, you know, from uh, The Roots. Yeah. And that was, that was brilliant, but it was based on Archie Bunker instead of pro wrestling. So he's he's prone to doing stuff like this. Yeah, it's I mean, it's crazy because, you know, his, he has to edit all this stuff. And it's right. also improvised through the drums, the video. Yeah. So it's, I mean. You know, but it sounds so, like progressive like it almost sounds like progressive neo soul yeah that's kind of the, that's kind of where it's going but wrestling sure. themed but wrestling themed. <laughs> i think that like there's a niche market of a niche market for that oh sure but it, it just has you, like most people i've shown it to like either most people have shown it to already are fans of wrestling but like the you know the, the few who weren't they were just like this is fucking brilliant it's <laughs> awesome man yeah, and certainly the fans of wrestling are going to love it, right? Like, you were just showing us the video 
you know, before we started shooting here, right after you shotgunned those white claws. <laughs> All right, this man. episode was brought to you by <laughs> White Claw. claw. Black, Please sponsor black us. Black Cherry White Claw. White claw. <laughs> <laughs> Even like while Kevin and <laughs> I you are know, drinking Bon and Viv. Yeah, we're not drinking White Claw before. The, yeah, well, I am. This portion of the episode is sponsored by Bon and Viv. Prickly pear. <laughs> and I've got black cherry rosemary. This is good. Bon and Viv, so. take your shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody wants to see some of these videos, where would they go look at them? Oh, uh, we have a website, WednesdayNightTitans.com. Yeah. And then we have a YouTube uh, channel or Instagram. No YouTube, though. No. Really? No YouTube. No. Who's doing your marketing? <laughs> well, you know, Jody, Jody still believes in YouTube. Well, there's, oh, I'm well, strong too. But there, you know, there is a uh, level of uh, copywriting we have to figure oh, out. Oh, yeah. There it is. <laughs> yep, yep, I get it. Yep, yeah. that's the, why. The very first episode that we did with Jake Sarek, uh, Mark references a Scorpion song. Sales of Sharon. Yeah. You heard that jam? What, what happened? Well, so he references it in the conversation. And I was talking about like getting high and listening to like my brothers and sisters. And we listen on, to Scorpions, and I'm just like, dude, why the fuck? I don't care about this. He's like, just trust me. We just just finished smoking a joint, turns it on. It, the song is epic. It does not sound like fucking Scorpions. Yeah. It's just like this amazing stoner rock. Yeah, fucking really perfect aggressive. song. And uh, so during the the interview with Jake, uh, Mark goes, "We're gonna." jump to that video right now so i like edit in like a 30 second version clip of it and before as soon as i upload it to youtube it's like copyright blah 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 blah. like i hadn't even released it on youtube like before it even hit the world they were like "Mm, copyright issue you're screwed so i had to go back i I think i think that shit's pretty impressive though like the and it's kind of scary well so what i still did how fast that like i mean like how does it do like just is it just like a tuning or is it by eight based on information like it's i mean i've done like cover videos where it does where it catches it too regular nerds let us know in the comments how that's possible (laughs) (laughs) we're we're, that's two like levels like if you're watching us or listening to us you're like already a bass nerd which right but to like know how to do that as well like how that works too that's like that's next level nerd Uh, you should be doing stuff like applying for macarthur genius grants and shit and not watching this youtube channel (laughs) they probably weren't watching the super bowl which just ended moments ago they might be don't put them in a box man I'm, try not to i won't you're right i'm sorry nerds There's our six fans might get offended. <laughs> don't unsubscribe we need your subscription uh yeah so well what you what you can do on youtube now is you can like put a little link there that links to that video i just can't like actually put it in the podcast uh-huh. so i think that's the way you're supposed to do it is so i did that so you, you annotated it yeah annotated it with a see once we to... once i'm done talking i don't go back you have the task of editing stuff together i just like yeah, i don't, I, I don't need to watch it <laughs> well, i knew we it was spent cool. three hours with jocko and i had to go through that another three hours and cut stuff together and edit it and that one wasn't too bad because my video switcher was working but uh yeah yeah so well it leads us to where we are now um well so what's up with Fork? What are you doing? What do you guys got going on? <clears throat> we just put a new record out. Yeah. Um, recently. Was that on? Was that on a particular label? Uh, I don't. I think we released it ourselves this time. Okay. I don't think they're doing anything with the uh, ground up. Ground up. Even. I thought yeah, that was Rope Dope for some uh, reason too. Yeah, Rope uh, Dope's doing a lot of like jazz fusiony stuff. I know that. Yeah, I think they, I think we're, it's independently released this time. That's yeah. the way to do it, man. Yeah. Because they were. I mean, obviously with the Snarky Puggy. Pucky, Puck. and Starky Puppy connection. Never heard of them. Who are they? Yeah, <laughs> who is she? So, I mean, I, Henry, I, I think made a decision not to. Yeah. Keep going down that avenue. Yeah. You know, so uh, there was a departure from that that band. Yeah, because you know Michael and Henry started the band. Oh right. right. And then. Yeah, you're filling in for some pretty big shoes. Yeah, there. big shoes. Yeah, and uh, he uh, he left because he was just. Of course, he's doing a million things. Mm-hmm. He's got it, the Funk Apostles and all that, right? Well, that's Corey Henry. That's Corey. That's what I, what, isn't that who we're the talking Michael about? Lee's oh, you're talking about Michael Lee. Bass, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bass nerds. He's a nerdy bass nerd. You call right? yourself a bass nerd and you know who Michael Lee what is? What the? <laughs> yeah. I'm very familiar with Michael Lee's work. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, the bass mafia. <laughs> that's the only mafia. They, 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 they choke yeah. people out with bass strings. Oh, that's, 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 isn't that how fucking Luca Brazzi went? Was he, it well, a, it was a piano one. Piano one. Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Thick ass string. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, you can do it's it. kind of a guitar string or yeah. bass string, right? Same yeah. Thing. I would say, like, you would need, like, if you were going to choke someone with a bass string, what gauge would you use? <laughs> I mean, it, it would. I don't know. Maybe it'd be better to have a lighter, right? Start cutting. You know, like yes, a, like a high C or right. yeah. Uh, well, F. to cut, yeah. But that that shit might break with yeah, more, all the tension. Break, yeah. I would probably use like a. <laughs> I would Somewhere use, in the forties. I would use a Bootzilla fifty-five, <laughs> one hundred five, because it's uh it's coated, so I know it's gonna last longer. <laughs> You could go through so many murders with them. That's how I would kill someone with a bass string. I, would I use think that. I might use the DR Neons for that. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit of pizzazz with murder. Right. What color, though? Uh, well, I mean... You want to get them to match the red. You want to say yellow or green because it would really stand out, but then they might see you coming, so I feel like That's it's true. like a red or a darker color. <laughs> so like you still get the cool like black light effect, but... That you, you could still surprise them with it. You know? So you, but you're gonna stick with a high C. <laughs> no, because <laughs> that sounds like torture. Yeah, for them and you, that, that would suck that'd their be, hands. That'd be terrible. You gotta wear gloves. <laughs> yeah, it'd have to be like lower than a B then. Yeah, you think? What Maybe. was what was the gauge that Jocko put on his <laughs> low C sharp? Oh like Jesus, two oh five or no, something? No, 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 it wasn't that bad. <laughs> two oh five. No, 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 it was. But it was like up to like one ninety. Yeah, what? he's so, got. The, he had this concept in the eighties while in prison, and he tells the story very amazingly on our second episode, episode of Bass yeah. Nerds. And he uh, he had this concept for the uh, the subcontra bass, and he's calling it a subcontra because it was basically tune. Below in fit, C fourth, yeah, below uh, low B, yeah. so the E string, the low E string, would essentially be where the G string is. So it would go from from E down to B down to F sharp, F sharp down to C, C sharp. sharp. Yeah. And so like he has two albums with it. One album is called the Low C Sharp Theory, and it's I love the way he recorded it too because it's just like all improvised, a hundred percent. Yeah. And there's two guitar players playing mostly simultaneously. And he, the way he made them record, he would say, like, he told one guitarist, you go into that booth, you go into that booth, and he wouldn't let them hear each other play. Yeah. The whole album is on there, and it's just, like, this ultra-low frequency. So, like, when you hear the album first, you're like, this is cool. It's, like, seems a little, like, meandering and low, but, like, conceptually, it's it's there's something there. But then when you hear the story and you go back and listen again, it's like, oh, this is fucking brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. It sounds awesome. And because of that subcontra bass was a low C sharp, he needed a rather thick string. Baby dick. Who <laughs> made it? Uh, uh, the first one was Dean Markley. Was it Dean Markley? Dean Markley did the first one. And then... SIT. SIT picked him up. Uh, so, yeah, like Dean Markley was there in Michigan at the time. But then they realized, like, we can't stop production to make these strings every time, unfortunately. And, and Jocko's cool. He's just like, totally, totally understand. And then he was introduced to SIT strings and they're a little bit more set up to do stuff like that, the way that they make their strings. And so they do that. Um, so if you're ever looking for custom gauges and stuff that like, like down to the minutia, right. huh. that's something to consider. Like a lot of string companies will do that. Um, like smaller ones, like Labella is pretty good at that too. I love the Labella crew. Like yeah. I love their strings a lot. And then uh, SIT makes great. Actually what SIT really does well you know how like sometimes you'll play strings like especially flat wounds for a long time like lot like years and you say like yeah I haven't touched them in like three years and they sound fucking amazing. Um, they have like the, the warm thuddiness. SIT kind of does that uh, with their what is it called? They have a series that emulates it's like oh, the so compression like wound. Really? Yeah, but like for years, you oh. know, like and they sound like super thuddy. I just know, switched cool. over the round wounds again. Oh yeah, on my P. What are you playing? Uh, is, that, is it that is that moon base yeah, or Mulan. Mulan? Mulan, yeah, yeah. That, that shit's awesome. So wait, which which ones? High beams, DR, yeah, high beams. I think. Yeah, oh, the blue, the no, blue. Uh, oh, nickel. nickel. I like nickels. Round oh, I like pure, their pure nickel strings are great. Yeah, they're super great. They, I play and they last forever, you know. Yeah, they sound they sound good, but I think for like more the more aggressive like Wednesday Night Titans and like four stuff that you've been doing. Well, it's, I was starting. I was I had I love those Dunlop low tension flats. 
Yeah. yeah. Those yeah, still great. Them. Yeah. But I started changing those out once a month. Yeah. So I was, I like the, I was, my ear, yeah. forever I played a 73, 73P bass with dead flat wild strings. Yeah. Eventually it was like, yeah, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, it's just phases, I guess. But yeah. It just, you know, especially with Jimmy, because, you know, it's like there's so much sonically, all this, you know, it's a very loud band. You know, so right. Jimmy's dimed out and Rick's dimed out. <laughs> My MPEG is like on two o'clock. Yeah. You know, so yeah. we're loud. Yeah. So the, the, the flats were not cut, like the, the flats were so overwhelming with the, it's like the low mids for that kind of music. Once I put round wounds on the P, it was like, it's worse. But I still play the J majority of that band. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And what J bass do you have? Move on. Yeah. Yeah. Move yeah. on. That, you, that that company is incredible. Yeah. Like yeah, that that's like out. the only like I think probably the only budget friendly uh like P and J style bass that sounds legit. And like they, and the feel they of feel. Them. Yeah. I mean I, I got Tim O'Fabe hooked me up with him six, seven years ago. He's he's, he's we mentioned him a few times on this <laughs> yeah, place. He's, on yeah. the he's he's got a really good ear. Yeah, stuff. it's I mean it's crazy, you know, he they how they just he was playing in South Korea and the Young June just didn't know it was Brahma bass. And he's like, holy, holy shit, this is amazing. Yeah. They were they were so cool. I mean, they, they hooked me up with, that's kind of my first real endorsement was with them. I didn't have yeah. anything going on, really. Right. You know, I was in Atlanta, you know, but they're, and they've been amazing ever since. Yeah. I mean, I think I, but two, the two biggest companies that excite me that I've played has been Sarek and Mulan. Yeah. For sure. Well, and, they, and they both do, like, Mulan... It's exciting and fresh because they're doing a budget-friendly, realistic, vintage-style, vintage-sounding, vintage-feeling, like, Fender-style style, style mm-hmm. bass. Sarek is doing his own thing altogether, right. yeah. but still re- retains that sort of, like, vintage, like, wink. Yeah. It's funny. I, I was nudge. just, I just, I was on Jam Cruise. Um, Were you playing the cannoli bass? No, I had, I brought my four-string, Sarek, mm-hmm. the B90. Yeah. But, I, but... I didn't basically long story short I had these you know I had a super jam with Marcus King and I had a uh, jazz gig with oh. Benny Bloom yeah his comedy jazz thing yeah but I had a night that was advertised and I, I, I didn't have a band okay because I thought I was running a jam but then I got kind of confused I'm like no it was your night so I was like I'll just find guys on the boat it's a right. f- cruise you know? <laughs> that's awesome so I uh, so I'm eating dinner and Charlie Hunter sits down and oh shit I mean, me and Charlie have a bunch of mutual fans. We've hung out before. And he could do a show by himself. Exactly. Right. But he, uh, we were talking about how blown away is by, was with Jake's work. Because it's like, how does, what, like, what voodoo is he putting on these bases that are short scales? Right. That they're, they're in tune and they, and they sound that good. And it's pretty freaky. I mean, when I first got that, that B90 four string, um, I guess the Midwestern, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. From, I mean, right when it came in the mail. I was like, this is making me play completely different. So it's like, if I do my own thing, it's a lot right. of times it's with a Sarek, you know, because yeah. it just makes you play differently. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, we definitely had fun with it. He brought in a couple when he was doing that uh, the podcast with us. Uh, definitely checking out a few of those things. And then at the NAM show, I played the Grand, which is the new short scale that'll be coming out later this year. Fuck yeah. Uh, and then that yellow bass with the three J pickups mm. in oh, it. Oh, yeah. That thing was really cool. Um, and yeah. then when we were at the Bass Bash, uh, Ben Kenny, Incubus, did his set and was playing his Sarah yeah. all the time. He's, he's getting a name. He's, he's yeah. definitely like the cool kid in, in, in the bass world right I now. Mean, it's, it's the amount of people that ask for that bass is yeah. it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Know? I mean, like, I remember, <clears throat> and, you know, the cool thing about you know, the Atlanta bass player scene, that's where I was at, is that everybody's really tight. Yeah. yeah, you know it's it's like there's maybe like eight of us or something. Yeah. You know? and, uh, yeah. You know, I, when I got the Mulan down to Atlanta, everybody's like, yeah. Oh, so everybody's getting Mulans, but the, the when Sarah came in, it was like that was like people showed them my more bass players showed my jam to, to come check out like oh he's got a Sarah. Yeah. yeah. What well, was that gonna sound over, like? You know. Right. And guitar players are attracted to it too, just because of the style. I think. I think what it is about him and the, the other uh, the other company to kind of really break the mold. I mean, on, on a much more conventional level, is or commercial level is uh, Reverend, 
to, they're yeah. like they're just like he's got unique body shapes that are kind those are of, really cool they yeah. are they're really cool Great so Reverend's got point. good one, really cool ones and then and, and Jake Sarek he's got really cool body designs and like yeah. the sound they sound awesome I mean, of course and that's, they feel really different they're like thin but not like they're the necks feel really thin but still comfortable me having larger hands yes. the way he, he's got them shaped like there's usually like a subtle V shape to him that yeah. I like a lot. Uh, yeah, it's, is it's, that is that true on yours? Oh my yeah, it's it's because I mean yeah, we've all played short scale bases. And right. They're cool. Yeah. Now, but I would there'd always be a moment where, you know, almost a novelty would wear off to me. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. okay, well this sounds either too muddy or too this and it's fun to play and Yeah. I'm and, too vain to play one publicly. But you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But the Fender Mustang doesn't fit you too well or what? I don't fit it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But you know, I've like, recorded with them though. Sure. Oh yeah, it's, it's, they're fun as like you said, man. They're fun as hell. But that yeah. kind of wears off, right? Yeah, yeah. But exactly serious, no. I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, again, it goes back to Tim. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, Tim was like, oh, these are great. It, by the way, that light is blinking over there. Does that mean anything? On the camera? Yeah. Where is there a light? On the side, the red light's that? blinking. Oh. I don't know. What'd you do? Did you break it? Oh no, they, yeah, yeah, they're supposed to. Be. They're supposed to blink. That means we're recording. This podcast was brought to you by Canon. Our blinking lights let you know that it's working. It's working. It's, working. it's not saying help. I help. mean, that, it looks like a fucking warning light. Well, <laughs> yeah, that means uh, we're good. Anyway, uh, so Tim introduces you to Sarah. You end up playing some gigs with it. You play on the jam cruise, and you're just basically told like. You just got to find people to play with. So yeah. you sit down with Charlie Hunter. Yeah, so then I suggest, hey, Charlie, you want to play a gig? He's like, sure. No, no, no. I've never done this. I didn't <laughs> yeah. really know this. And he's like, if you get me a guitar, I'll do the gig. So I got Charlie on it. Awesome. And I got um, Alex but, Metropolis. Wait, so wait, was he there playing or was he there as a spectator? He was doing, like I think, like a master class and he had a solo set. But then Garage Matois was playing a few sets. So oh, nice. Like reunion of that. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, it was it was really cool. And I, I was like, Charlie, we're gonna improvise. We're gonna we're just gonna improvise for right. Right. Yeah. Because no one's really doing the boat. It's mostly of course it's like tunes and yeah, you know, I ran that I ran this jam for fourteen years in Atlanta, it was all the improv jam. Right. So I was like, we're, yeah. gonna, we're gonna bring that to the table and see right. how good or awful this will be. I yeah. I definitely lost my chops with that one. I was like cutting my teeth when I was fourteen and fifteen playing in bars in Louisville with my brother. We would do mostly entire sets, completely improvised. And this is these are these bars are open till four a.m. So we were playing for a long time. Yeah. And then like, you build the chops up, and then I've been so far removed from that because, I've just, I like things with more structure, you know. And sure. I like I just I lost that muscle, and I found out right. recently. I was I sat down with uh, some dudes, and we were just trying to like like just just in a practice setting. It's the, that guy Nathaniel Murphy plays guitar he's a sick sick guitar player um and like it sounded cool but i just like was like this just doesn't feel right you know like i'm, I'm totally like I, I, I you know what i think it was i was not listening to the band as right. much as i feel like i should have when you know I, what I mean when i was coming up you know like early teens that's where like i was like this really good guitar player in my bedroom right and like could shred and was really into like Metallica, whatever I could rip. But then like I started doing open blues jams. At like 15, my dad would take me to the bar and he would sit there and I would play. And like, I was this good closet bedroom player. And then all of a sudden I sat in with these killer players and I was terrible, right? But then I just kept, I would two, three nights a week, I would go to whatever jam was in the south side of Chicago play and then like over the course of the next six months like my ability to play and my talent just grew exponent it was crazy like how much better i got once i kind of like had some terrible sets and really didn't know what i was doing uh and then all of a sudden start like slowly figuring it out and like that you know you you don't always remember the good gigs, but you always remember the terrible gigs. Oh, and it was that, the getting embarrassed on stage, but like for whatever reason going like, oh, I could, I know why I was embarrassing and going home and trying to figure it out and just sitting with people. And uh, it's definitely like a skill that you gotta hone and I haven't done that in a very long time. But like at the Bass Bash, I know like Cody Wright's set, I talked to him before the show and he's like, oh yeah, it's all, 
we're all improvising everything up there. You know, it's just going to be it's just going to be fun and, and do it. And I think some magic happens in a lot of those cases. Well, it's you know? interesting because yeah, I mean, I started that jam when I was 21, and of course back then it was like, well, we're 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 playing jazz, right? You know, and um, I did that for a few years, and basically the you know. I was like kind of fed up because in Atlanta, like this great trumpet player named Joe Granston uh, started a, a real legit straight ahead jam on the same night as mine. And after doing that for two years, I was already getting back to like rediscovering like my, you know, like basically origins as a musician, which was metal and improvised music and R&B. Because, you know, for, you know, obviously... Those are three very different things. <laughs> but, you know, when you're growing up, it's like... Yeah. It's, I started playing bass because I heard Duck Dunn on Green Onions in the Sandlot. You know? Yeah. Even yeah. though my, all my parents are professional musicians, it was like... Oh, really? But, it, but you, don't think, you don't think your parents are cool back then. Right. No. right I want to be right. an NBA, but I heard, you know, even though I've been around bass players, and my grandpa's a bass player, it's like, oh, what's that sound, you know? Right. But, you know, there's a, there was a few years of my life where I was really wanting to be a jazz musician. Yeah. You know? And I just said, everything else is bullshit. Yeah. And uh, I just remember, I remember just having the realization one day of like, well, I'll essentially be like faking playing this music for the rest of my life because it's not, it's, I mean, let's be honest, like, you know, like I was born in 84. I wasn't born in the 40s and right. was 20 years old in the 60s. Right. Yeah. And I remember hearing, you know, because I was such a huge metal freak growing up from mostly death metal and thrash and yeah a little progressive period mm -hmm. you know but um i remember weed eater you know those guys of course yeah. you do yeah uh they came through atlanta and this is phil and selmo's band no weeder is that band i'm thinking super joint yeah, sorry super weeder is that yeah. band from south carolina yeah dude yeah the dixie big yeah bass. yeah dixie dude. yeah dude uh what's the the fucking um there's oh shit there's a really great album title that's like it, it, it's like a it's oh, i can't remember the god, name god god luck and good speed yeah <laughs> that's that's one of them <laughs> yeah. They, yeah but those guys are hilarious he always like goes cross-eyed too when he plays <laughs> and he drinks a whole ball of jack every oh yeah Williams he just fucked up. yeah but, but, but actually the guy who did my most recent um album like used to hang with those guys big time he's like those guys, it's a miracle that they're still alive. Yeah, I mean, they, they rip. But, uh, yeah, so they're playing, and, and the drunken unicorn. And, uh, and back then I was living in Alpharetta, a suburb. So I was like, I'm going to venture down to the dangerous city, because I'm from right. Northern Alabama, so it was, you know, it's a huge... You'll see weed here. And I remember going seeing them, and I went, why have I been denying myself right. of all this music? You know? Right. And that's where it kind of ventured into, like... About the same time, I heard Wayne Cranch for the first time. Yeah, which was like when I first heard Wayne with uh, with Tim and Keith. I heard him with Keith and Anthony. Mm -hmm. It was so weird because like this, the concept of what Wayne was doing was like in my head. I thought I was like inventing this concept of like really hard, aggressive, improvised, you know, rock music essentially. Yeah. So I got obsessed with that, and then. Um, I turned basically I turned the jam into all improv jam because the manager at the time at the five spot, we used to butt heads all the time, and she changed my um, jam to an open mic for a minute, which was a total disaster. Oh yeah, <laughs> ran all my friends out. Oh yeah, right. and it brought all these you know I idiots in with right. acoustics that yeah didn't know what they're doing. So I had this evil plan where I was like, all right, you know what this. I'm just gonna just throw a hail mary and like I booked like seven guitar players, two drummers, three percussionists, nine or ten horn players, two bass players, and we basically just vomited for an hour or two. And you just right. ran a ran a train basically, no, or did they, you all play the whole all time? the same time? It was nice. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit! It was completely it's scratch and sniff improv jazz you could think of. And it ran everybody out. And <laughs> but did you all have fun? We had a blast. But That's the, all that matters. The, the owner of the place, Kurt Hollingsworth, who's like, you know, he's one of my best friends. He was there, but he loves that shit. Yeah. And, and she was, after that point, was like, I'm not doing Tuesdays anymore. Yeah. So that's when we made the transition of doing the more free stuff. 
and um, you know, it, it created this really cool scene in Atlanta because at the time before that before that kind of happened, Atlanta was still very separated of genres. Okay. Yeah. To me. But what were the uh, what, were, what were the sections? It's like you had the blues people, like in Marietta or like Northside Tavern or um, Blind Willies, mm-hmm. and you had like the jazz dudes, and you had the whole indie scene, um, in like East Atlanta, and you had the hip hop scene. And there's a jam band scene down there too. Yeah, at the time well, it's funny that like, when I was when I moved there, I was playing the I played the Brandy House here on Mondays when I first moved to Atlanta. Yeah. So it was like the the jam band scene was kind of going, kind of it was like kind of going out compared to how it was before I moved there. Well, it, well it, why, widespread panic is from down there, right? They're from Athens. Athens, okay, Georgia. Athens, Georgia. Yeah. So you know, so yeah, so the <clears throat> the Krantz, I got real big in the Krantz, and then when I started working with Bruce, you know, like Bruce's was his, he was an amazing improviser, but on guitar or whatever he picked up, but he's also doing performance art. Then I started doing like, you know, an improv set because I do like kind of comedy performance art for years every week. And is this Bruce Hampton? Hampton yeah. In the oh, rest in peace, man. Yep. Were you at that show? I was. I helped You're plan pro- it. I was on stage with him. Oh my god! Wow. Yeah. That, do you know the story? Just for people who don't know the story, actually, you should probably tell it because you were fucking there. Well, yeah, uh, Bruce had his seventieth birthday at the Fox Theater, sold out. I think six thousand people. Uh, um. Me and Dwayne Trucks and Matt Wilson and, and some other guys were we planned this his seventieth. You know, it's a big deal. I mean yeah. so everybody's contacted from his career. I mean, most people were there who made who made a huge impact with Bruce. And uh basically he passed away on stage on the encore of his seventieth birthday. You know. Wow. What a way to go. Yeah. I, I mean, mean that that that's the way he he was ready. Yeah. Was, He's like going to the mothership. It's Pretty profound. Yeah. You know, because... Well, how did you end up passing? Heart attack. A heart attack. Yeah. Wow. Is it just like mid-song or like... And he's it's over and then he's not feeling well and... Well, he, I mean, he it, just... He died on the stage, He died right? on stage. Yeah. He, he collapsed and we all thought for a second that he was doing his Bruce thing. Right. He, he was like on a different... Yeah. One of those guys like on a different plane of existence... But brilliant musician, and like like the, the the spoken word stuff that he would do, like with Medeski, Martin, and Wood, that shit was so good. Yeah, he was this weird mystic man. He was. Yeah. I mean, everybody, it's like it was kind of a rite of passage if you a musician in the South, if like if Bruce wanted you to come play with him. Yeah. It was like a, an, a real, ass kicking for the ego, you know, yeah. because Bruce, was always things in one essentially. You know, he was like a mystic. He was this. Avant garde musician, he was a number savant. Yeah, so you could get your birthday. He was an astrologist. All you right. know, he knew he somehow was. You know, he was a, one time he was a professional um, softball player. He was mm-hmm. a comedian. He was a tour guide. Uh, he taught. You know, he taught golf for years. You know, I mean, the guy was he like did this, it all. He's right. in the Renaissance. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so yeah, we you know. He essentially like inspired, you know, like Jimmy O'Teal and Jeff Sive of Crim Rescue Unit and Matt yeah. Bundy. Bad, bad, so fucking good. Yeah. Oh Listening to like, God. yeah, like early 2000s too, like O'Teal just fucking shredding. Wasn't he playing, wasn't Kurt, well, the Colonel, he was playing mandolin on some of that stuff. No, that or was Matt Mundy. Matt Mundy, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I got I a recording and stuff. Yeah, somebody told me that he was playing mandolin well, yeah, he had, on that. Bruce had a Chazoid back then, which is this tiny little guitar. Maybe that's what it was. You know, but yeah, it was, because, you know, it's like O'Till and Jimmy and Sype, you know, that was like, they all came through Bruce's camp. Yeah, you know. and then Jimmy had uh, Jazz is Dead with... Uh, Billy Cobham, right? Yeah, that, that was the yeah. That was after that when Bruce was. But yeah, but I mean Bruce was just this. You know, he would destroy you, but yeah. also like kind of build you up. But it's kind of like Zappa of the South. Yeah, very you know? much so. Yeah. Except Bruce was spectrum was like he was real into like the the spiritual realm. Yeah, I mean it's so weird. I remember, you know, even his. He comes up and 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 these connections he's he's either said or did comes up nonstop in your life once you're in. Yeah. You know, like he told Jimmy, you know, in like 1989 that sixes were gonna haunt you for the rest of your life. 
and sixes have haunted him huh. forever. I mean, it's hilarious. Like we we went to Japan recently with a five of seven. Yeah, and we saw a bunch of sixes, and we're just kind of laughing about on the the way to the airport. We pull up, load our bags out. A car pulls up behind us, a little taxi, six six six. And then Jimmy looks down. He's standing on number six. Yeah. So Bruce would make these predictions about you, and most of the time they would come true. Wow. You wow. know, especially about musicians' intentions, which he, that's what he taught everybody. It was like, it's like, why are you doing this to yourself? That was his whole thing. He's yeah. like, are you doing it? What are you doing it for? Fame, chicks, money? It's like, why? Are you, why are you? Gonna, why are you going to torture yourself to do this? To, right. just to be like, make you really think. Yeah. Like yeah. Pure intention. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think a lot of people end up like have their reasons for making or creating music, and then sometimes that gets diluted, or you start to lose track of it, or you know, all of a sudden you're in a band and you've got four other people who have their ideas of what music you should be making, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden you start compromising what you're doing, or uh, and you know, some I've always kind of been a like. Uh, you know, the Phil Lesh. I was never a Jerry Garcia, right? You know, I was always that kind of guy who, like, went along with a lot of the things and was not a very resistant person and would definitely compromise. I, compromise is probably the wrong word. Like, I don't feel like I compromise. I felt like I was working with, you know, talented people and a lot of times would take their advice over my own just to, like, oh, I, I'm not really attached to any of this. Let's just have fun, you know? Um, so it's nice to... You know, when there is that, if you've got a good, strong leader, like sometimes being the follower ain't so bad. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's uh, totally. And know. it sounds like he had a lot to offer teaching wise. Oh, yeah. Because, cause I mean, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take his own advice a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it was just. I'm a victim of that too. But yeah, but he, you know, I mean, he, uh, he, he would have these insane ways of of just saying things where it was like in, no one knows it's coming towards you like it, it's not a negative way it was right it's like you know for when I first started playing I had a problem being late for everything I had a problem yeah that's a that's a big problem that's a problem I man. had a problem and you know, I thought you know a lot of times it was not intentional but maybe subconsciously it was right yeah and man I mean the second time I did that with him he just he gave me this look and he boxed me for the entire weekend. Yeah. You know, he went and talked to me. <laughs> yeah. And I, and he would, you know, and then he would do this thing where he would, he would, you know, like, <laughs> he would, you know, because it would always be him, guitar, bass, and drums in the band. But he would somehow, one weekend, pick a favorite. You know, so yeah. then you're kind of jealous almost, like, oh. What, yeah. What, what do you got going on over there? Was, you know, yeah. was, but that, that, Second time I was late, it was, and, and that was doghouse. Yeah, that and that was there was never a third time, right? No, it's <laughs> right? a good uh, lesson, man. So that's what he would basically teach you was like important shit of like, yeah, right. Don't waste know, anybody's time. Don't waste people's time. Like, yeah. oh, you know, I mean, his big quote too, one of many was, um, "Take what you do seriously, not yourself." Yeah, that's, I guess a, that's, that's a really point. strong yeah. fucking words to live by. You know, because right. who yeah. wants to be around like a serious yeah like, but, musician or doctor right. simultaneously? Yeah. Someone who's not taking what they're doing seriously, right? Yeah, like you're. It's just living a life deliberately. Mm-hmm. You know, like you can have a fun life and just kind of go with the flow, but you got to do do it as deliberately as you can. Exactly. Like, I'm going to deliberately do this because this is what I need to do. You know, it just, it, it, I, I found that it's been a lot more enriching, but that's a really good way of putting it. Right. And another one good one was all insults or compliments, comp- compliments or insults. You know? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, we've all played. That sounds like a very Zappa thing. That <laughs> does, actually. Yeah. Oh, right. That does sound like a Zappa It just gets thing. you out of your own head, too. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, I mean, how many, I mean, it's like, I mean, how many times, I mean, speaking for myself, there's been plenty of times in my life where I've seen things live I did not like, but when I, when people come, you know, someone comes up to you, you're like, oh, man, it sounded, it sounded great. I mean, right. but intentionally, I was not really digging it. Right. right. Yeah, so, I've done, done that a lot. Before. Yeah, so so why does it matter if, if you know, if you know, where you, if you, obviously we all play, and you 
playing for a long time. It's like you know when you're yeah right when you're on I mean, and when you're big not. part of this is just doing it for us. Right, you right. know, like oh, that's a huge part of it. Yeah, right? like I'm just I just want to make records that I feel like listening to. Exactly. Right. Like there's plenty. There's so there's so much fucking music out there. Right. So much, and it's it's good because like you can you won't get bored. You don't like you know unless you just won't, don't want to do anything regarding music for a minute. Right. Just take a breather and a break from it. Play video games or talk about sports or whatever. It would work. Chugging White Claw. Chug, chug and White Claw. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you just like you hear all these things that like I I hate hearing I I hate asking myself or saying the words like. Well, it's cool, but it would be cooler if, or what if it did this? It's just like, why am I critiquing somebody else's artwork? I'm just going to go fucking make my own. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I've definitely done that too. Why critique somebody else? Just make your own. If you don't like it, make your own. I spent so many years wasting time doing that. Yeah. Right? You know? Oh, yeah. It becomes it became so fucking vogue to shit all over everything. Yeah. Well, that, and in addition to, like, I think a lot of people fall victim to... Uh, I've I've half written a thousand songs, you know. I could oh, never course. finish anything because I it was just like self critical or it, you know, not the song is never done, you know. So I've like learned that I had to have kind of a writing partner to like mm. kind of yes or no things or come up if I did come, you know, I wrote we've all written a thousand riffs, but maybe it's a great chorus but it's not a great verse or vice versa, and then you just like you might I like I I regularly I just open my computer turn on iMovie and my camera from my computers on and I just play right and then if I work something out then I've got a video of it and I've got audio of it and I've got so you can see see what I'm doing yeah like how you emoted in some right. certain way um, and a lot of times I'm playing in weird tunings or with a capo or whatever and if I had to like transcribe it or relearn it with just the audio it's going to be a problem you know it's going to take a lot of work but I've got you know, a hundred hours of this stuff and it all just sits there because I never, never get it done. Never Dead get it lines. finished. Right. You See, I've got a hundred hours of uh, parkour. <laughs> parkour. Like, remember the office episode? I just, just watched it today when I was making the buffalo chicken dip. I was like, I swear to God. You made that? I did. Yeah. I was making it. Uh, was I was putting good. it together and I was like, I was put on the office and that was yeah. the episode that came on. <laughs> parkour. Parkour. <laughs> it's so funny. Dude, Sorry to derail s- your, your nice profound so, thought. Dude, those tacos are oh so God. good. That, that, so that's tacos. a recipe that Thea found. Oh. Um, for those of you who are wondering, the recipe is below in the description. No, um, no that, uh, Thea, found, Thea found the recipe a long time ago. It's a slow cooker recipe. Yeah, that stuff is and, so uh, good. I actually bought a slow cooker like we had one and then I got rid of it because I'm, I'm a tyrant no yeah. see we no well, there's the, an instapot yeah in there. but I, I got a crock pot slow cooker so the yeah. instapot doesn't like it does slow cooking but it's not really that good at it like nothing beats a crock pot so I just yeah. I bought a crock pot yeah, a couple days ago just for this so if Thea found the recipe you just get like just pork butt you yeah. know and like I hate. I personally hate what what I'm about to do. I hate when people do this to me, but I'm gonna do it anyway because it's really fucking easy. You chop an onion, you throw it in the uh, in the bottom, and then the spices. You just rub it all over the fork, and you put it in on low for like eight hours. Hour, right. Um, and you put a. She always makes me put a, and she does this too. You put a jar of salsa in there. Yeah. So it's cut up an onion. You rub like cumin and chili powder and right. salt and pepper all over the fucking pork butt. You throw that in there and pour a jar of salsa in there and you turn it on slow for eight hours. It's oh, easy so as good. hell, falls apart. Yeah, that it was delicious. delicious. Yeah, super, so good. super good. Super Mark, good. Mark hosted a Super Bowl party. Football! My favorite part was J-Lo and Shakira doing a um, dance-off. That's because you're a pervert. <laughs> I enjoyed <laughs> Andy Reid getting his first fucking win. <laughs> that dude rules. We were talking about him earlier. Like, you know... Like, there's one side of me that's just like, you wanted to win, but the other side's like, motherfucker, you had T.O. and Donna McNabb and Brian Westbrook on the same team, and you still lost. Like, I know it's not his fault, but... It is. It's his fault. It's his fault. <laughs> what the F? What the heck? <laughs> no, it was, it was a good game. It was fun. Well, yeah, that last quarter there was ridiculous, was man. Pretty... They were down by 10. Yeah. And then uh, kick some butt. So, anyhow. Anyhow, so... You're on a cruise ship. You get a guitar player. Not, not just the guitar player. Charlie motherfucking Hunter. <laughs> Charlie Hunter. Yeah. Uh, do you get any... Who else do you get to... I get uh, this guy, Alex Metropolis. Okay. Pigeons playing ping pong. He's a great drummer. Mm-hmm. 
And I get my buddy Kevin <clears throat> from Corey Wong's band, the keyboard player. Oh, oh yeah. Man. Nice. Um, he's a beast. He's amazing. He just played yesterday. Over oh, really? at Dally Hall. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I tried to get picket tickets, Pete. And you fucking failed on me. I was going to take my friends, and now he didn't. So, just calling out my friend Pete Falknor. Yeah, Pete. God Fuck. damn, Pete. Damn it, Pete. Damn it, Pete. Uh, Should you have a segment just damn it, Pete? From here on. So, uh, you don't even know Pete. I don't no, know either. Pete. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck Pete. Yeah. Just kidding. Uh, love Pete. Pete in high school used to bully me. Wait, really? No. no I'm just... Oh. We can find him. Yeah, it's well, easy now. The, it is the easy now. Yeah, it is definitely not hard. We're just guy. <laughs> yeah. I, want I don't know. We'll, we're going to kill we'll him with <laughs> what string were, was your string of choice? Low, uh, lower than a low B. Right? Yeah. So thicker than a so one, sharp. 125. Yeah. I'm going with a bootzilla. <laughs> Any, anyway. Uh, so then are you, you got, are you just calling out keys and 145? Yeah, we... Um, we just kind of just improvised. Like I start a groove, and then drummer hops in. Kevin would start a groove, and then Charlie would start a groove. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was would cool. they stay on one key, or how would they progress? We would either call where we're going, or yeah. we kind of go there sometimes. Yeah. yeah, you know. What's so? What's your advice for for someone who wants to get into more improvised music? Just do it. Just do it. Start playing, getting in jams. Yeah, and stuff. I mean, yeah, because essentially, like, you know, like. The the Krantz gig, like the way he looks at impro- improvised yeah. music, is so interesting. Because you know he pe- you know he ke- he picks a key center A, yeah, and it's pretty much just open, yeah. You know, I mean, it's not like we're up there thinking we're in A minor or even A major at this point. Yeah, yeah. It's just like A, we're gonna blow in B, you right. know. But the key is just not listening to yourself, really. Yeah, for me. Yeah, well, that, I think that's my biggest struggle. Just knowing, and then obviously, like, kind of going, weaving in and out of a, an idea. And the hardest part is, like, just knowing when to shut up and also start a conversation. Right. Because sometimes, you know, if you've, obviously, if you improvise with somebody for years, it's a lot easier. Like, my buddy, right. Darren Stanley, drummer, and Spencer. They've got tells. Yeah, I mean, me and Darren and Spencer did that Tuesday night gig and Monday night gig for four years every week. Just all right. improv, so it's like now we're at the point where we can just create, you know, like a seven chord song live, right? Because it's so comfortable, right? But when you when he does this, Phil, you know he's dropping down or yeah, whatever. We just know each other, right? You know? Where compared to like you know doing like a jam with all improv like brand new people, you're kind of like still sniffing ass, yeah. Kind of like, oh, what's this about? Yeah, right. but it's really just about not listening to yourself, you know. And as a bass player, to me, it's knowing. Where the tension needs to come in, right. yeah, you know, obviously effects pedals helps adding <laughs> yeah. or subtracting tension, but like, right, but that's kind of the cool part is when you have everybody listening. So, you know, your advice really is to drop your ego, yeah, for that because it's more about, and I guess that would be true with improv comedy. It's like not about you; it's about the scene exactly right. you're building, and I guess the whole like yes and aspect. Do you? Agree that that is well, for sure, but it just but also just knowing when to to have the command as a bass player and also when to lay back. That, yeah, see, yeah, I was, that's the yeah. that's the hardest. My wife just flipped me off. Oh, nice <laughs> on camera too. That's that's her that's her sign of love. Though. Anyway, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, it's like a it's a that's that's always been my big thing too is just knowing that it's not going to be good or. Or it's, I mean, it could be literally, I mean, out of all, as many years as I've done it, you know that probably 80% of it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> right. Probably more. Right. You know, so it's just having the confidence to say, you know what, this might be the worst music ever played. We're still going to do it. Yeah. You know, I, you know my, my brother hosts something in, in Louisville. He's got this band, two bands. One's called Vox Populi and the other one's uh, The Human Project. And... It's usually like an audiovisual sort of thing, and it's like 100% improvised. And I, I've done one with them, and like I just was so nervous about everything, and I was just like overanalyzing everything that I played and stuff. We had this cellist who was on there, beautiful stuff, and I just felt like I was taking command too much. But then I was like in it to like I was in too deep, and I was just like I just got to keep 
keep steamrolling <laughs> through. Get through it. You probably do the right thing. Yeah. If you felt it. Well, some people, you know, somebody's got to be the leader. Somebody's got to direct it, right? Uh, but I remember reading a um, an article, I think in No Trouble, that Damien Erskine wrote. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, does a lot of session work. And he's like, I always start from a place where I want them to say, play more. You know, like I, I try not to start from this really aggressive place. I start from a place that's really simple and straight. And then, I mean, I know my abilities. I know I can always add more color and more flavor to it, but I always try to yeah. keep it simple at first. And then if they want more, I'm happy to give it. So I really took that advice to heart. And any session I did, I think, from that article that's on, a really, I was always that's like, good advice. That's keep it advice. super simple. And then you can always build on something. It's, sometimes it's really hard to cut away. You sure. know, a groove or whatever you're. Well, I mean, it's like that's, you know, some of the James, you know, James and stuff. Like, you know, he was a genius, and we all adore him and spent time with him. But if you right. think about it, like those songs he was playing over were busy. I mean, the, there's so much melodic content going. Yeah, on. that's huge. He has, he has any. He has so much room to move. Right. Or that's that was my whole thing. Like you know, my James and phase. I was actually doing a lot of session work then. And I'd show up these sessions when I was younger and be like, try to do all this, that kind of feel. And it never worked. Because mm-hmm. right. like, really, there wasn't a lot going on melodically. Right. Or with chord changes. So it's like, obviously, like, start with the ground up basic. Right. The producer or whoever says, man, why don't you do something here? You know? Or I do now, if someone wants me playing one of their songs, I'll, 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 I'll give them three options. I'll do three tracks. Yeah. Takes. Yeah. I'll do... It's completely simple, as basic as I possibly can. Right. And then I do what I would play over it. Right. Which is not much more than that. Right. Mm-hmm. But then I would also throw a real busy track. Right. Because, you know, they, they'll edit it how they want. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's, if someone sent me songs, that's how I would do it. Say, right. Yeah. Basic me and then. Right. Here we go. Completely busy, obnoxious. And you could end up with the U track and. and right. Like, or versions of all three, right? Just, just cut it up. And, it. You're right. Do it anyway. You know, I I found what, who, the really awesome bass players as far as like being able to play the melodic stuff and like sprinkle it in. A lot of gospel players. Yeah. In fact, Scott Devine. I don't know how recently he did the video, but I know he like did a video fairly recently. At least it popped up in my feed again. And I became reacquainted with it. Where he did this. Where he's like, this one lick will get you through like any like gospel change. Right. And like it, it was. Uh, I think it was. It was basically like a. One six four one yeah. groove, and like the way he broke it down, he like played this. It was this, this pentatonic fill yeah. basically, um, but he would do it on the one, and then he did the whole fill, the, the fill on the two, and then three, and then four, yeah. and showed how it would could carry over the measure and stuff like yeah. that. And like when you hear it in like those different ways, it's like those little subtle tricks can like it's just you put that in your fucking tool chest and you whip those out and it could sure. sound really busy but it's still melodic and oh yeah and pretty and I'm, I'm if you hear like people like Jocko like you you hear specific riffs that he'll do in a lot of songs like little little licks and stuff but with Jamerson I never I never heard him play the same thing twice no it was a uh, well Jocko was more a composer too yeah yeah, yeah. you know Jam- Jamerson was like Kind of that, like, um, Curtis Mayfield, where, like, chill but intense, right? Yeah. Like, Curtis Mayfield had that really intense thing, but he was always, like, kind of whispering what he was saying. And I feel like the same way uh, about James, where he would just, like, he was, it just wasn't the, it wasn't the focal point of the track, but it fit in the mix so well. And then, like, I, you know, sometimes I didn't really even realize like as much work as he was doing. But then I started watching those YouTube videos where they visualize yeah. him, yeah. the track going, and you're like, holy shit. Well, I, think guys... the, I think the bridge, though, in terms of modern session playing like that, and, yeah. and Jamerson was Chuck Rainey. Yeah. Because yeah. Chuck, like Willie Weeks, again, legend, motherfucker, mm-hmm. huge influence, but like there, he still had a lot of the Jamerson stuff happening. Yeah. Well, Chuck Rainey had that, but he also did like more, you know, like kind of more modern sessions, sure. obviously. Right. So I, I mean, I think, I think Chuck is probably my favorite of all those guys. Yeah. Right? Just because of the diversity of what he was doing. Yeah. Taking the Jamerson feel, but then doing his own take on it. Yeah, I think that was one of know? like 
the first names Jocko dropped when he was like, what were some of your influences? That was his biggest, was like, yeah. Chuck, Chuck Rainey. Yeah. Uh, have you ever, like, have you ever sat on one of his clinics before? Yeah. Chuck's, they're amazing. Uh, I bet. He's got the best stories, and he's he's such a great voice for those in storytelling. It's, it, yeah. If you ever, I think there's, there's probably a few of them that were recorded. Oh, I'm sure. Um, just, just checking them out, just, like, listening. I could listen to that dude talk for hours. Right. Yeah knows it all um so how did you end up becoming the bass player for fork how did that unfold i mean a lot of i mean <clears throat> all this i mean through the Krantz gig yeah um because you know henry hay and tim and zach danziger they had this band called boomish i was obsessed with as well growing up okay um you know tongue-in-cheek german bass music yeah it's very innovative but also had the comedy thing very bruce yeah stuff it's weird that and you know anyway it, but yeah it's like all this visual audio crazy drum and bass music and and so henry hey i knew henry from that and uh, all the other stuff he's doing around in new york so one day henry calls me on the phone and says hey you know michael's taking off would you want to maybe come do a run with us and i was like sure so i did and i guess it's like two or three years ago but i've been with him ever since, since. Mm -hmm. Nice, and you, I see you guys are you guys are doing like a European tour here pretty quick. Yeah, well that's we mostly play in Europe. Yeah, you know it's it's a, a bigger market for the band. I think. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I mean, we've we've uh, we've got a few U.S. tours. Yeah, and, have a, and gotten decent responses, but overseas it's a lot bigger responses. Do you think yeah. that that's the general direction that live music is going in? Because I see a lot of like some of my more favorite heavy bands. They're, I mean, historically metal and heavy music like does well has done over there, mm -hmm. but I just see them spending more time over there than usual. I mean, just yeah. I mean, it's it's it, it's more money and passion. It's more passionate. I mean, to I me, mean, the touring I've I've done haven't done much touring in the U.S., but the touring I've done. Like, there definitely seems to be, like, New York and Nashville have these huge music scenes where people just, like, just go out, check stuff out, and really support what's going on. Even, like, Philly, um, L.A. I feel like Chicago doesn't really have that, like, tight-knit or big of a music scene and a lot of other parts of the United States where it's just, like, I don't know if they just aren't into it as much, don't appreciate it as much, don't, you know, whatever. I think the metal scene is very strong here. The yeah, metal yeah. scene is very strong. Very strong. Yeah. Like, I, like, I I played, you know, I we had no problems getting shows and being put together on yeah. bills, and, like, everyone's super supportive, and it's not, it doesn't feel competitive. It's, like, in some scenes, some circles, it feels like things are, like, competitive, like a lot of the indie bands and stuff. Oh, yeah, cool. Like, fighting over who's going to play second instead of third or something like that. I mean, that that's bill. kind of the place where I've always been. I, yeah. I've, I've never, I, I mean, I was in that's metal bands in high school. That's why the scene It's that comp competitive shit. Well, that, yeah. I think it's, it's, like, it's hard to make a buck in Chicago a lot of times. You know, some of these venues are charging a 300 plus dollar like, operation fee. Off, straight yeah. off the top of your door, you know, and like, <clears throat> even if you sell the place out, you're lucky to walk away with 300 bucks or something like that, you know. It's uh, well, it's also know. strange to me. It's like it's like the Atlanta syndrome. It's like you have, I mean, Atlanta's metal scene strong, always has been. Yeah, but like other genres, it's like, I don't know, people just won't. They would more people would rather go see Madonna at Phillips, yeah, than they would. You know, some awesome band coming to the Earl, right? Know, two or three hundred seater, right? And that's what was that was always kind of like our my crew of guys down there was our driving force was we're going upstream, right? We have no support from the city or really people that weren't in musicians, really, right? You know, mm -hmm. right? But then eventually he kind of caught up with me, yeah. Because I was like, I can't run this jam for this long, like, why am I gonna keep doing this to myself? Because yeah. like I love seeing my friends. So like it you're doing like Bruce talking, you know, but it's like, I don't, where are people going to start coming out of this? Well, yeah. Like know? how much are you making per jam? Are you making any money on this? No, no. You know, no. I mean, a couple I drinks had, and I mean, essentially I had, at, when I was at Elliott street, Mike and Pete had me on like a salary deal. Yeah. Um, which was nice of them. But when, um, 
Yeah, you know, but that was only for four years out of fourteen. Wow. You know, right. so that was the thing. That was the only kind of my judgment around town was like, hey, I'm I'm gonna give you this opportunity to come play all improvised music for an hour, right? And be and meet be in this really cool scene. And like the whenever somebody asks me for money, I was like, they don't get it. Yeah. Right. Because you're not gonna right. get paid to do that anywhere. No. Anywhere. Right. No. Right. <laughs> I have to go pee. Love don't it. stop. Here you go. We're pausing. Pause. He said, "Don't stop." No, don't stop. Don't, don't stop. stop. He's gonna pee. I'm gonna put the here. I'm holding his microphone over to the door and see if we can get some of his his pee sounds. Hold on. Oh, he turned the fan on. I want to see if he farts too. If you got, I mean, you have to. Oh, I hear it. I'm getting it. We're getting it. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good stream. <laughs> yeah. You can hear it from here. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I guess, I mean, like, do you, what, what's, what's your advice to that guy or to that, to that player, that person who's just like, I'm going to play music and I want to make money playing music. Like, what do you, what do you say to that person? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, we should all, I mean, we're, our profession hasn't progressed since the 70s of, like, of in terms of, like, local pay. Yeah. I mean, you know, my dad and uncles were making the same amount that you'd make now in the 70s. Yeah. For a local gig. Yeah. So, I mean, my, I mean, my advice is, like, you know, I'm, I can't judge of what anybody wants to do or why they want to do it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'll put it this way, like, you know, for, uh, for years, you know, I would just basically make ends meet playing and, right. you know, I did like a frat band for a long time called Holly Kind for six years, but I'd always put time in, in Atlanta to do my weird things that I want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Just in my vision and knowing eventually if I carve out a stamp for myself in the city, it can pass along to other, like basically it's like your calling car every week. It's like, if you want to come see what I'd really do, come to my gig. Right. I'm not going to make a dime off of it. I'll get a lot of drinks right. or whatever. But it was, to me, that was worth more worthwhile than like only playing corporate gigs two days a week. Right. You, you know, it's like, yeah, like there's not much. I mean, like there are plenty of people who have built careers doing that. There's the the local band. Sure. We talked about this before. Like the local um, cover band. Uh, it's it's like like a conglomerate now. It's uh, they're called yeah. Maggie Speaks, and they have like different band offshoots and stuff, and like a four. They're all and stuff. yeah. They're Insurance all players. managed by the same guy or group. Yeah. Of so people, there's a way to do know. it that way, right? You know. But I mean, it's but if you can, I mean, if you can see it, if you really find that fun. Yeah, they sure. Go for it. Yeah, a lot like, of people do, for sure. Yeah, but if you, if you're like, <clears throat> well, I, I mean, more of the person who comes to an improv session mm -hmm. expecting to get paid, you know, like, like, how do you navigate that conversation with that person? Do you just like let them figure it out? Well, or? Sometimes I would just ask them, "How much do you want?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would that just be the, the and the uh, answer is always like, well, what, uh, what you know, what, what can you afford? I you mean, know? sometimes I would just dish it out, right? Yeah. Sorry, zero. Or, or some, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's been plenty of times where it's like, oh, okay, you need fifty bucks, I got you. It's kind of almost like a thing for me where it's like, right. Well, here it is. Right, and those same people aren't calling you for gigs, right? Right, but, you, but, <laughs> but it's like it's like you're putting the good juju out there. Putting good juju out there, but it's also they know that no one else is right getting paid, including the leader. Also, what's the fifty bucks really going to do for you? That's what I'm saying. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you, you know? know. Yeah, uh, I mean, for some, you know, there's definitely been times in my life where you know I didn't have fifty bucks, but. Uh, yeah, I think like nowadays the music, you know, if you want to do music full time, it there's you got to kind of put your hands in a lot of different things, you know, like I was a musician, but I also worked at Bass Club Chicago for a long time doing the retail as Mark did and uh, doing lessons. And uh, I think the most money I ever made, I lucked out and uh, was doing jingle music for Oprah Winfrey. Uh, nice. did that for a couple of years and I was like one of 20 producers, you know, and we got known for like dancey, upbeat stuff. Uh, and I would get quarterly ASCAP checks and they were, they got pretty decent for a while, you know? Um, 
But it was, I was teaching lessons for a while. I was doing whatever gig I could to make 50 bucks here and there. And, uh, but it was, it was a struggle. And then I turned, I got into my thirties and I was like, man, I'd, I'd like to buy a house one day. Right. You know? Uh, so now it's, I have my main gig, which is not in the music field at all. And, uh, I still get, you know, scratch some itches doing stuff like this, uh, playing, I got a band with my wife that we do like, but we're really focused on getting like placement, TV placement sure. ads and stuff. It's not like, uh, we're playing gigs out anymore. Uh, that's not, we've all had our passion projects and, you know, well, it's also like, I mean, everybody, you have to have a side hustle. Right. I'm sorry. Right. Like it's, I mean, for me, it was, I started a business where I was doing booking a corporate band. Yeah. But no one knew I was doing it. Right. Because, if, you know, eventually you get a hundred dollar to death. Yeah. You know, and the, at the time it was like, you know, I was like, man, this is just killing me. So I was like, well, I'm good at booking and I have a band I can book. And even if I take 15% off the top, which is still lower right. than what the agent's going to take, which I feel good about. Yeah. I pay my guys more. Right. But you're still making a good extra chunk of change a month. Mm-hmm. Right. It's work. Right. I mean, having to deal with, a, you know, um, bride's mom a week before, <laughs> their expectations are usually kind of like, you know, like, well, he wants to play. It's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> right. What were the some like some of the more bizarre requests? I oh, mean, yeah. the we, most the most bizarre was an entire Beatles set with a band called Atlanta Funk Society. I was like, well, the band we only do funk music. Yeah. Because she goes, well, a band doesn't know the Beatles. What kind of musicians are you? And I was like, oh, don't do that <laughs> bullshit. And I was like, well, we all know Beatles songs, but you just hired a funk band, right? And, and we all don't know all the songs. And we're not and playing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. And then of course the bride apologized about right. it. Which is which is some bullshit. Like she shouldn't have to do that. No. You know what I mean? Oh no. No. Yeah, but people, you know, people don't know what they're doing. Oh, but moms, I, I've, moms just make weddings about themselves. Sure. <laughs> some the do. wedding they didn't have, right? Uh, like that's a, no. I mean, like I just, I just, I, I say this about my mom, who I love dearly. Um, but I just, I've noticed that, and there's like a couple other like friends, like moms, like they all have a story about how like their mom made the wedding. Like about them, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I got married at the uh, Cook County Courthouse, and my mom wasn't there, so there was that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was wearing probably what I'm wearing now. That's what that's what me and my wife just did. Yeah. Yeah. We, I got off the road, so I just go to the courthouse. That's exactly. And we're like, let's get married on a rooftop in New York on Friday. It's Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. So, do it. Do it. Lovely photos too. Yeah. But I mean, you know, it's it looks like, like a great time. It was. You know. Did you ever spend time over at? Uh, what's it called? Um, guitar shop NYC with the La Bella thing with Jimmy Carbonetti and Masino over there. It's in Brooklyn. It's off of Thirty Fourth. You got it, dude. When next time you're there, you got to spend some time. There send me a, Jimmy. Uh, send oh me a, yeah, dude. The Jimmy text. and um, Jimmy Carbonetti. Um, turns out he and uh, Eric, like the Coco family who run La Bella Strings, turns out they're cousins. Wow. And uh, they built this guitar shop, and they sell a lot of awesome boutique basses and stuff. Sweet. And then there's Mas Hino, who's uh, he used to do the uh, Pensa Sur guitars. Oh, and Rudy's just, over there. And then he now he's doing his own thing, Mas Hino. He actually builds basses, the Labella Olinto bass. That's mm. Mas's bass. And sometimes Jimmy will do the finish work, especially if it's aged. Sometimes they'll get Daniel Tobias to do the finish work because Daniel's the fucking man. Right. But, th- dude, like, th- I'm telling you, the next time you're in New York, both of you, like, you got to spend time there. I just saw it's it with the- Bass. I was like, what's that all about? Oh, dude, they're they're awesome. Hand, 100% hand-built by Moss. Um, just a lot of energy into it. And they feel legit. They feel wonderful. Just play themselves. Very alive, you know. And Moss makes the pickups himself by hand. And wow. Smokes weed all day. <laughs> <laughs> it's It's cool shit. Yeah. It, it's a really cool company, but like just the the way that the place is set up, it's just like a, it's like being in an apartment. If it's full of gear, you know? it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, it's a cool place, very nice. cool place. Nice. Uh, we were talking a little earlier. You had mentioned that uh, you, you somewhat recently picked up a dark glass head. Is that what you're? Well, yeah. For I guess it was uh, 
Yeah, it was Fort was in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, I like, guess that was a uh, year or two ago. Is that the? Did you guys play with uh, Spare Parts by chance? Yes, I know those guys. I did some videos with them. And uh, Ru- not not Rudy's. Um, Reggie's. Mar- Mar- Reggie's. Reggie's. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, they yeah, were the martyrs like, last time. But. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, wa- I was... Raise yeah. the man. Yeah. The martyrs. He's, exactly. He's, he's the dude, man. Yeah. He's, he's, yeah, he's the coolest. And uh, fucking um, Ed, not Edgar. Uh, well, Edgar's cool. Shane Tremble over at, uh, at, at Reggie's. He's a great guy, too. The, like, those two are like room. old yeah. school. You yeah, guys, cool. I'm assuming, played the big room, right? Not no, the, we played the small room. The, oh, the music joint? Mm-hmm. I had a the residency there. Yeah. When they first opened, I had a residency with oh, yeah. this uh, girl I played with, Deanna DeVore, and it was like acoustic duo. And we were like, it's, I think we started like within the first three months of them opening Reggie's, and we were there, I don't know, whatever, every Thursday night for six months or something like that, and played. And never really took off, but it was a fun time. I, yeah, well, he, you know, he, 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 I got introduced to Dark Glass, and I read about him. Yeah. I was on tour, and. <laughs> I just I just tried to sell you the fucking preamp instead. I, I was know, like, you but, need the head. Yeah, it's uh, awesome. D7K I got it, but... or whatever. The... Uh, no, the Alpha Omega Ultra. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I swear by that thing. And then like you walked away, and I remember like you, you came back, and you're like, I'm gonna get the head. <laughs> yeah, because I needed a head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, was, I, what were yeah, you playing up until that point? I was trying hard just point. to tell you to get the preamp though. I should have. Uh... I should have bought both and spent yeah. all my tour money in one day. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I should have done. You know. Um, what you know, were what were you playing up to that point? Well, up to that point, I was, you know, my first bass ever, real bass ever bought. My money was the EBS. We're right after high school. Okay. Was it the Reed Marhead? It was a 350 HD. Oh shit! Yeah, the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Jonas Hellborg and Marcus Miller played them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. But uh, and after that, after that, just died eventually, and no one would fix it in Atlanta. I started reading about you know trying these Class D heads, and I hated all of them. I still do. Yeah, you know, not a big fan of the Mark bass stuff. Or yeah, I think Aguilar sounds good of of all of them. But so I this I found this company called Speakeasy, and I don't know where they're based out, but they made B three preamps. <sighs> all right. What I figured out though is the guy was basing it around a basement, so it was kind of like this kind of basement on steroids. Okay. So what was, was like, the wattage on that? Uh, two hundred watt tube. Tube. Mm-hmm. So I got a power amp, put it in a rack, and I carried that thing around for years. That was my base amp. I was like, I'm not playing Class D bass amps. I did the same thing for years it's with not the Skunk Works. Yeah. And then I mean, I started, the Dark Glass stuff came out. After the power amp died, I went on Craigslist and got like one of those Ampeg, uh, um, the Portaflex, Portaflex, head? yeah, it was an eight or nine hundred and right. a matching fourteen cap for like three hundred bucks for all of it, yeah. right? You know, and I played that, and that was like a real, that sounds like a nasally SVT, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> I just, you know, the dark glass has been very impressive, you know. Yeah. I mean, I have it, I take it out with, me. I mean, it's so small too. I can fit that, my Noble, and my pedals in a carry-on case. Yeah, yeah. So I'm good to go, you know. So is that your main head now? Yeah, I mean, besides, I got a SVT. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes you just need the aesthetic of the, of the SVT <laughs> on stage. SVT. Yeah, I mean, it's they funny. They sound good. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, it's, it's hard to beat, like, a Noble and an SVT. What, uh, what SVT, like, what era do you have? Is it a new one? Like no, a I, got, I got a 2006... Was it the uh, CL? Okay. Yeah. So does it um does it have like the gain and the master volume? No, <clears throat> it's just got the just volume. No, it's got it's got gain. So I learned a trick from Dino. He, do you remember Dino? Do you know Dino? Oh, he used to work. He, is he still work for Ampeg? He, well, he works for Yamaha, but okay. does Ampeg? Okay. Yamaha. I talked to Dino Ampeg. before. He's awesome. Dino's the shit. So yeah. he taught me a trick about oh, yeah? those. He's like, do you you know how you get the the blue line sound out of the the classic, the one that an amp you have. And I was like, what? And he's just like, what you want to do is you want to turn, first turn the gain all the way down, turn the master volume all the way up. Then you use your gain as your, your volume, volume instead. What you're doing is you're opening up the whole 300 watts, just like the old ones, and it, rather than smacking the preamp with all of that volume and getting like the broken up sound on the front, if you want just a clean, big, 
fat, yeah. warm SVT, like classic sound, do it that way. And so I did, I, had, I would play on gigs and I see a classic there and they're like, yeah, the classics just don't sound like they used to. I'm like, really? And I did the Dino trick and they're like, whoa, that sounds awesome. I was like, I know. That's, Thanks, Dino. <laughs> they, yeah, Dino's the shit, man. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're listening or watching, you're an awesome dude, and I highly recommend you do a lot more clinics. You, you, dude, he's he's the shit. So yeah, that's that's a, that's a fun little trick. So like, what uh, the dark glass though? Like, what uh, like what's your go-to setting on that? Do you ever like just leave the? Do you ever leave the the, the gain on, the distortion? I mean, I've used a distortion when I, with the foot switch. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, I usually keep the vintage on all the time. Same here. Yeah. I mean, just keep, just might as well tape that on. Yeah. Um, but I just, one thing I love about the head is that I've always been obsessed with like mid range, mm -hmm. you know, because it kind of separates like, you know, I understand there's a good, there's a specific sound for a, like no mids, highs, and lows. But yeah. it's like dark glass, the mids just, they just come out and it's so clean and mm -hmm. just brilliant sounding. Yeah. With all bases, I mean, that's what's so crazy. I mean, yeah, whether you're playing a war, have like a Warwick or a Music Man or a P bass or whatever, they all sound so good through. Yeah. yeah, some people like they like. I don't know. I, I hear this grumble that come goes around with the dark glass stuff, where they're just people are like, "Yeah, it sounds like a dark glass." I'm like, "What does that mean?" And they're like, "Oh, it's just distortion." I'm like, dude, no, like absolutely not. Play play a lot more with. I think I think you're you, you might be just using the one distorted sound i think that there's a whole lot of sonic capability with those right. things i'm my the thing that i love the most from them I, I love it all but my favorite thing is their uh not the super symmetry i'm sorry the um the compressor pedal what is that fucking thing called the hyper hyperluminal yeah, yeah. that's crazy the hyperluminal you can do the fet style uh compression and you can do the all buttons in like the classic UA eleven seventy six, yeah, and it sounds like Tim Bogert immediately. It's wow. like it sounds exactly like it. And like I never play with chorus, never ever touch chorus. Don't like it, you know. Like unless it's in the studio because they have the rack, and usually the studios that I've played in, they've got the eleven seventy six. Right, that's the sound I know. That's fine, but like everyone, everyone that claimed to do it just couldn't quite cut the mustard you know and then this comes out and it just fucking nails it so if you haven't played one yet i highly recommend that thing. i need to just that, that one it. setting just always leave it on yeah that was a that's a fairly newer pedal from them guys yeah um, it sounds then, good on guitar too yeah and then they also just uh i think they just released those cabinets right the new they did. Neos. How are those? Uh, they have a Neo. I haven't really a new out. neo like they have 12s now like a no. single 12 and a 212 yeah well, yeah and an eight eight ten, and they're doing like neo. I think their eight ten clocks in around like a hundred pounds, which is is light for an eight ten. It's very right. light. Yeah, and they sound right. fucking massive. Wow. I'm all about the lightweight, man. I'm tired of breaking my back, and yep. I used to have a Mesa Boogie two ten, what they called a road ready cab. <clears throat> it was built into a flight case, and it had <laughs> metal corners all the way around, and it had a front thing that latched and. There, it was over 100 pounds for this 210. And one time, I almost knocked myself out. It's after a gig. Oh, no. Or I'm loading up for a gig, and I had a Jeep Cherokee, and the, the back hatch wouldn't stay open. You'd have to, like, prop it up. So I'm, like, trying to put the cabinet in there, and I got the hatch on my back, and I'm trying to put it in, and I slide it in, and I get caught on something in my head. Bam! <laughs> right into that cabinet. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. Done. You're lightweight like you still have vision <laughs> oh it was rough man and then uh so now i play the burgantino lightweight oh, yeah. you know the cns i love burgantino stuff um, yeah and been a fan of dark glass stuff for a long time you know sold a lot of their a lot of their pedals those b7ks b3ks distortion overdrive pedals um all really good stuff so what are you what are some of your go-to pedals <clears throat> um of, i mean I usually have tuner, and then an OC2. The most important one. Always have an octave on the board, and then some kind of distortion. Yeah. What What do you use enough for an octave pedal? Uh, OC2. OC2. The old boss OC2. Oh, the, okay. Is it one of the Japanese-made ones? 
I have one of those, but I have most of the time long ones. I have like five. They sound awesome. I can't. You know what sounds really good? Like a lot like an OC2 if you're ever in a pinch. if Because you when you go to stores, like, like let, let's say you're on tour and your OC2 craps out. More, more often than that, you'll see like Boss will be there. Right. They'll have the OC3. But uh, the MXR, vintage, the, yeah, the, the, the vintage uh, Octopedal, sounds dead on. It sounds yeah. it's really, small really good. too, right? Yeah. It sounds great. That's awesome. Uh, the little blue one, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one I got. I that's that the beauty the of like Boss pedals and like MXR. Like people mm. sometimes like these like fucking cork sniffers, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like the boutique pedal world. Right. It's like the same, it's the same demographic, I feel, as the guys who like just only drink IPAs and stuff. <laughs> like it's this cork sniffer BS. Or only White Claw. Yeah, like they'll, they'll tell they like, unless it's like one of the original Japanese made bosses it's not for me i'm like Motherfucker, mm, i can i, I can have fun that. with a ds1 i love the metal zone i think right. it's a great pedal it's, yeah, do you <laughs> and you can find them everywhere and they're right. built like tanks yep. like when's yeah. the last time maybe okay maybe the tu3 you break a knob or like the dd3 like you, you you break a knob off or something like that but when's the last time you had to replace a boss pedal yeah i never I have I exactly yeah, i don't think i have it's weird nope they're doing it right yeah. never have yeah <clears throat> Uh, what are you using for distortion then? Uh, for a man, for, tell me what gig I'm doing. Like, if it's a freak out gig, then I use a, a, a this this company called Acorn. You heard of these guys from Atlanta? No, mm -hmm. they're like a boutique guitar amp company. Yeah, they're pretty amazing dudes. They make pedal clone pedals, so they they cloned a rat, '80s rat. Right. Yeah. So I, that's what I've been using lately. But you know, I mean, I've been th through so many phases, like. You know, trying to find the perfect bass fuzz. Yeah. You know, and like, I love the Woolly Mammoth. Yeah. That looks fun. But yeah. I'm not going to spend $400 on it. Yeah. Yeah. So I got the uh, Ass Master. That's a good one, the, like the Maleko. Yeah. Right. And I love that thing, but the output's too, like it's too hair, like hair sensitive where it's either too soft or too loud, but it sounds yeah. great. I had one um, of those for a while. Well, and, and the Germanium one. Do you have the Germanium or the Silicon? You know, uh, I don't even know. No, I think it might be the. Uh, is it the red light or blue light? Red light, That's green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the red light is the is the silicone one. Yeah, I think we can look it up. Nerds, let me know Nerds. if we're right. Let us know. <laughs> I'm probably wrong. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe he said that. That was a silicone version. It's definitely <laughs> like a What he just, he doesn't know anything. <laughs> All right, calm down, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> nice. Uh, you also told us you just recently moved to Nolan. Nice, nice pronunciation there, bub. No, um, <laughs> you sound like a local. Oh, no, you couldn't even tell, huh? Uh, so, how long have you been there? Uh, since uh, December, th December 31st. Oh, so like a month. Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a month and a day. But on the road, majority of it. Yeah. If you if you could if you could approximate in let's say let's do this in the metric system in grams, how many grams of beignets have you had <laughs> in these two months? Uh, let's see. Powdered sugar. God. <laughs> Are you going to the what's the place? You tell him he's the guy who lives there. Uh. What's if we do more? Yeah. Is that where you're always going? Well, there's supposed to be like... The ones, right? There's supposed to be better ones. <gasps> oh, oh, of no, course. They're they're no right. one's mob is listening. They're going to get you. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's supposed to be like more... I mean, because you know, it's obviously a touristy place, but they're delicious. Yeah. Right. Um, I've heard there's other spots that have like better... The underground. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll find those and continue to... Please eat, let me know. Eat a bunch of them. <laughs> find, a way to, I find a way to ship some up here. Do it. Yeah, I'm not going to turn that down, man. <laughs> it has to be away. You've got my address now. I know. <laughs> yeah, overnight wait till, wait till the mail you're going to get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll send you some cannolis. You send up some beignets. Yeah. It'll be a good time. It'll so, be a good time. let's talk about cannoli for a minute there. Like, what's... Like, you don't you don't look Italian. Well... I'm just saying that. My my biological father was Sicilian. Really? I'm Sicilian. Then it's Fonti. Ah. Well, then I'm incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> Now here's the thing. I'll show you evidence of this. If I cut, if I cut my beard off, I look Italian. But my other side of the family, my mom's side of the family, was like pure Scandinavian people. Mm -hmm. 
and then all the way back to. You got Sweden. the Scandinavian vibe going on yeah. right now. But check this out. I'll you look like you are like in Peter Bjorn and John, even <laughs> 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 in. By the way, I, I could be I, like a UFC dude, fighter, I've maybe. Seen, <laughs> I saw those. That is an incredible band, by the way. What band? Peter Bjorn and John. Oh, right. Yeah, they're so good. I miss them a little bit. So, yeah, like. What's your favorite cannoli flavor? It's classic. Yeah, it's classic cannoli. I mean, the, the real cannoli that has the the uh, the orange. Yeah. You know what I'm about? I know. Yeah. You know what's up. I know what's up. Yeah, but the whole cannoli thing happened because. I got obsessed with cannolis. And then, I mean, look at this. I mean, that's, that's with no beard. Oh, yeah. That doesn't even look like you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Show it to the camera. <laughs> yeah. So look at that. I mean. That's him. Who is that guy? Yeah. That is. Uh, <laughs> that paisan. Yeah. What's, what's your dad's last name? <laughs> what was your dad? What's your dad's last name? Fonty. Well, I'm sorry. Fonte. Font- that's that's Guido Fonte. Yeah. <laughs> right there. That's Giuseppe. <laughs> what's what's Kevin? Like what's Kevin in Italian? Well, what, what, there is no Kevin. I don't think so. No. You're Giuseppe now. Yeah. You're Giuseppe. <laughs> See this ring? There's only three people in the room. No. <laughs> only three people. The Irishman. In the <laughs> One of them's Irish. I had to watch it in in three different times or maybe four. I, I loved it. I thought it was good. Did you see The Irishman? I loved it. I fell asleep through halfway through it. Like, I, you know what? <laughs> there, there are some movies it's okay it. to fall asleep to. Like, I fell asleep to The Big Lebowski. It took me like four or five passes to watch it. I'm glad I sat through it. It's a great fucking movie. Right. Irishman's long, you know? Yeah. Like, and most yeah, of the time, you're like, you, you're like, I know it's three hours. I got to get in the headspace to watch this. And, you know, yeah. like, you end up watching it late at night. And, of course, you're going to fucking fall asleep. Right. But yeah, it's, I got to get to the whole thing. It. It's worth it. It's such a good movie. Yeah, I this watched bad, it. This episode is sponsored by Martin Scorsese. <laughs> He's a producer. It's ball sack. <laughs> Why? Martin, where you at? Martin. Come town. <laughs> where you at? <laughs> I, but I love how fucking subdued Joe Pesci is in that. It's just wonderful to see like that dynamic range of that that actor. It's so good. Yeah, that was a, man. It's such an amazing story too, right? Yeah. 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 Apparently, my great grandfather was friends with uh, Hoffa and has a watch. There's a fairly family heirloom that uh, Hoffa gave my great grandfather. Uh, we're gonna cut this segment yeah. this for our for Jody's safety. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've seen how this ends, man. <laughs> Well, uh, well, great grandpa's been dead for a long time, and I don't know where the watch is, but apparently it was inscribed like from Hoffa and the Boys or something like that. Wow. My grandfather, we were born outside of Detroit. My grandfather was a sheriff of the mm-hmm. town, so I, I mean that's all I know of the story. So it sounds that, like your grandpa was paid off a few times. He he might have buried someone, you know. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I really don't know, but uh, yeah, it's a good friend. Though. Hoffa and yeah. the Boys. Good friend, you know. Like, hey, I need to bury somebody. Good friend will I ask mean, you. I mean, and like Who's outside car are we of yeah. Detroit, exactly. you know, not in Detroit, so like far enough away where, you know, people wouldn't see or know. Yeah. You know, and we were from a very small town outside of Detroit, South Rockwood, Michigan, town of 360 some people. And how many of them are Juggalos ballpark it? Oh, honestly, I don't, I'm probably not much. I, they're just farmers and good old people. And <laughs> it's not much. But it's not, honest work. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, I guess even if it's not much, if you only are a town of 300 something people, like it's still a pretty good percentage, right? Yeah. You know, so. Uh, That's where my favorite yeah. boxer's from. What's that? Detroit. Detroit. James Dude. Tony. James Tony. I'm a, bo- I'm a a pretty big boxing fan. He's my all time favorite. Yeah. I love James Tony. You, you he box. turned into a no. big man. You box. Dude, I, I wish. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I wish. I was thinking about getting to it. There's, there's the boxing class. In a Krav Maga class yeah. that I'm kind of thinking about. I bought some gloves. Yeah. I went to title boxing a handful of times. Me and my wife got classes. Anytime I express any interest in anything physical, she's like, Jody needs this. Let's sign up. You know, she's a fitness instructor. You know, I got a few extra pounds that I could stand to get rid of. Yeah. So uh, she's all about like, what would you like to do fitness wise? And like overly eager, like how how did you enjoy the boxing class? You wanna you wanna sign up for more? Should we get like a a yearly subscription? And yeah. Um, no, 
I'm good. I'll, I'll watch uh, Canelo fight tonight. And, uh, <laughs> we're good. The we're extent good. of my fitness expertise is fitness slice of pie in, <laughs> in my, my face. Mouth. <laughs> right. Uh, I got bigger than powerlifting for a minute. Yeah. Do I? Power I, was, I was doing. I was doing the Mark Ripito. Yeah. Lifting thing. You know. You know who else is into powerlifting big time? Is Doug Castro from oh, sure. Dark Glass. Yeah. He's got like if you follow him on Instagram, like he's all like whenever well, he's not eight months, but yeah. yeah, I was hardcore for a minute. That's cool. What what was you like? What's your deadlift? Would you would you max out at? Would you squat? Well, uh, my deadlift, I I think my max on a set was like three forty. Mm-hmm. Um, PR which is three forty, which bad. isn't which isn't really that much, but <laughs> for you know from coming from like my. Being a musician in my Lifting schedule. your bass cabs. Well, it's also like you go on tour, that's my problem with weightlifting. Right. It's yeah. like a sandcastle. Right. It's like yeah. you take three weeks off, you might as well take a year off. Right. Yeah. But so I always kept going back and I enjoyed it. I haven't done it in so long that it's been. You know. Yeah, I try to go to the Planet Fitness as much as possible. Right now it's about once, maybe twice a week, sometimes more, mm. sometimes less. Uh, but I'm also, you know, depends on what's going on with work and. Other commitments in life, it's hard to sometimes get to the gym. I'll find but, a gym in New Orleans. Yeah, I, you know, I actually want to do more yoga though. Me too, yeah. man. You know who's got awesome yoga? DDP. DDP. <laughs> Have DDP. you seen his yoga yet? I've, I mean, I've watched his <laughs> documentary. Oh, I've got it all. I've got no, the whole thing. You yeah. got the app and everything. Yeah, you doing the it's DDP the yoga? The YRG uh, workout system. It's just it's 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 fucking yoga for football players. Yeah, I, I tried. God, it's amazing. I, really, the way he talks about it, he like names he names some of the positions differently and stuff like that, and it's a hell of a workout. I like, bet every single time. Like, it is probably not what a true yoga enthusiast would recommend, but it's definitely a way to kind of like get people into yoga who right. like come from a more like traditional meathead. Like, or, yeah like i'm getting a meathead is exactly it like it's getting a meathead or a wrestler in, into yoga and stuff but the benefits of it I, I definitely need to do it more it's just entertaining to hear him like get excited about it like he of course of course you know what is fucking the, he makes he, he he incorporates the diamond cutter as a move you know, like, i swear to god i bet I diamond bet. does it he, he's got the the 11 move that he does um, the 11 like positions that he does and he's like you know the diamond dozen the 13th move i've never been good at math <laughs> he's like the diamond cutter and he does the fucking diamond cutter but like he does it he's like yeah it does. you know it stretches your back a little bit but it's more about getting you into the zone right you know? i mean of course he's gotta do i mean what would the ddp yoga be without it right everybody yeah. would be like it's, why are you the point, doing the this? point is it's a good way to get a good like yoga workout but if right. you want to if you want the more meditative qualities of, of it, course right. avoid that yeah. <laughs> at all well, costs what i saw it's a good from, way to get into it though it yeah for stretching it fucking is man well listen i mean doing anything besides sitting on your ass is probably pretty good right but what yeah. i really liked what i saw about the ddp yoga is that like you could be in a wheelchair and do it you can be very yeah immobile and you, he gets you started in a chair, and you slowly you'll start standing up, and over time you'll start to be able to actually be a flexible human being. And, uh, you don't have to like people who are injured can do it. You know, I'm not yeah. a doctor, but that's what he claims. You know, and if you watch some of the the YouTube videos, he's taking people who are, re- I mean, even like he had. Uh, Jake the Snake and uh, Razor Ramon. Did you see him doing it? Like Razor Ramon couldn't like get up out of a chair. And then, you know, six weeks later, he's like looking really good, you know? So uh, I also tried to get my mom to do it because she's got some knee problems. I was like, just do the DDP yoga, mom. What are you doing? (laughs) And I don't know that she ever started it, but yoga very much into it. I think if I can mix them both, like a good amount of lifting and doing yoga, it'd be the ultimate. I yeah. just got, uh, my wife got me a gift certificate for uh, cryo, like, uh, treatment where you go in and do five minutes of, like, negative 200 degrees in a fucking chamber. You haven't heard of this? No. Oh. So it's supposed to, like, it shocks your system. So you basically go, like, neck down. You're in this, like, almost like a standing, uh, like, uh tanning booth kind of thing but the temperature is like negative 100 and something degrees like it's super fucking cold right and you do it for like five minutes and it's supposed to like help your muscles supposed to like just shock your system and put you in a good place a lot of people like to do it like after a big workout 
and then you just do it for like five minutes and then you're done like a lot of big boxers do it like floyd mayweather does it really uh, oh yeah it's like does a big it, does it stimulate your muscles i haven't done it yet but i'll let you know how it yeah, goes so but there's uh there's a lot of youtube video a lot of boxers do it uh um, you take before and after pics of your balls <laughs> for you i will well, you know, I only got, one of them's fake, right? You know that, right? You have a nudical? I have a nudical. No shit. Yes, I have a I have a prosthetic nut, and I used to have to carry a card in case, like, I went through like X-ray machines or stuff at the airport, and they would go like, "What's that in your nutsack?" And uh, it is it's my nutsack. It is my nutsack, and I would show them a card. I I lost the card. Because it was really kind of cheap and flimsy and like yeah. not. It like, doesn't look official, but it is somehow official. Apparently, yeah. It was like a laminated piece of like business card, basically. And I don't know whatever happened to it. But uh, yeah, dude, I got to. So you want to hear a quick story about it? Please. So uh, for those I'd who. I love a good nut story. <laughs> for those who don't know, uh, back when I was like uh, 20 years old, maybe 19, 1920, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Uh, I probably had it for several years prior to being diagnosed. Uh, I definitely had one nut that wasn't like the others, but I didn't experience any pain. The any others. Pain. The <laughs> others. The other three. He's, got, he's down to two real ones. <laughs> uh, I de- there was definitely something different like about one than the others, but uh, I didn't experience pain or any problems, you know, urinating or sexual problems, anything like that. Uh, so I just kind of ignored it. I was like, eh, whatever. So it doesn't bother me. No big deal. Uh, and then I started experience like lower back pain that progressively got worse over the course of like three or four months to the point where like it was constant. It was excruciating, debilitating. I wasn't getting sleep. And eventually I go to the doctor a few times and we try a bunch of different things and then they discover that it's ball cancer. So, all right, you got to do chemotherapy. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to start all these things. Uh, first things first, uh, we got to remove your nut, the bad one, right? It's got to go. Uh, and we got to, at the same time, we're going to put your, like a, your immediate reaction is get fucked. <laughs> well, I'm like, well, I, I, at that time I was just like, well, I was, I, I, it really didn't hit me that I like had cancer and that I was, it was going to be really terrible until I got diagnosed the second time with cancer, which was like eight months later. Uh, but I'm in remission 13 plus years now and everything is good and all is good. I've had bone marrow transplants, tumors and all kinds of crazy shit. Right. This is all when I was like 19, 20. I spent my 21st birthday in the hospital. So that sucks. <laughs> so first thing they got to remove my nut and they're going to put a port in my chest, which is basically like under the skin, they could connect it to some big veins. And because I'm going to have to do chemotherapy, they don't, they can't give me, they're not going to stick me with IVs every day because it gets hard yeah, to do yeah. that constantly. Right. Right. So they want to put a port in my chest that they can just basically, it's an access point for them to always push medicine or drugs or my dad had that recently. So I had one of those put in. They were going to do them at the same time. So they do them at the same time, but they go, uh, the day before my surgery, I go to the doctor and they're doing like some, uh, preliminary surgical consultation, whatever. We're talking about what's going to happen. Right. So I go there and I'm like, Hey doc. Yeah. You know, so what's the, what's the plan? And he goes, uh, well, then I was like, well, so did you, did you get my fake nut? Cause we had talked about it prior previously. He goes, Oh, you want one? And I was like, well, I don't want to be walking in circles. Like, yes, I want one, <laughs> like you know? Throwing up my equilibrium. <laughs> He's like, I'll be right back. And he goes and he grabs this, like, brochure. And it's kind of like <laughs> Fabergé eggs, like the different <laughs> sizes <laughs> and levels, right? And he goes, well, you know, listen, not every ball is the same. We really need to measure your good ball. <laughs> And get one that's similar size and shape, right? So he like pulls out this. Like, squared. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've got a cashew shaped. <laughs> so he pulls out like a micrometer, right? And he's like, all right, well, you know, take your balls out. And he like literally like sizes up my nut with this micrometer and goes, all right. Uh, there's about, there was like six, maybe seven different sizes, right? I got second to largest nice. size. So, uh, okay, good stones <laughs> stone. <laughs> so they had to postpone the surgery a day so they could overnight the nudicle. Right. And, uh, so we ended up not having the surgery the next day. We postponed it one more day so they could get the, the fake nut in and they put it in and it, it exists. It's there. You can very easily tell that it's, fake it's kind of like a hard rubber silicone kind of thing uh doesn't really feel like the other one 
but I mean, you can't really tell from the outside, right? It just looks like nuts. Uh, but yeah, I've got this. This. <laughs> wow. yeah, that's what we're <laughs> talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got this uh, devolved. <laughs> it has. And I have a prosthetic nut to this day that's been in me for thirteen years or something now and it has like a serial number somewhere in a file yes. cabinet. Uh it exists. Scan it. <laughs> I have yet to get stopped by TSA. No one's ever said anything and it hasn't been an issue yet, so uh Yeah. Hopefully that's... it'll it'll stay that way. So yeah. Mm. Uh <laughs> yeah. Thirteen, fourteen years later. In remission, cancer-free, feeling good about Congratulations. life. Congratulations. Kevin, Thank did you. you expect that we'd be talking about... Fake nuts? nuts? I, I, we didn't expect anything. <laughs> that's the funny thing. It's straight man. <laughs> I know. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, it's Jody. That's the amazing thing. It's me. Yeah, dude, I had uh, cancer twice, high-dose chemotherapy. I had... My doctor was Dr... Um, Dr. Einhorn, based out of Indianapolis, uh, he was Lance Armstrong's doctor ah. when Lance had his ball surgery. And Brief stint is Ray Finkel as well. That's an Ace Ventura joke. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Wasn't following you there. What but... was that hello? What you two were trying to do? Like Ace Ventura. <laughs> hello. <laughs> I don't think he ever said that. No, he didn't. I was referring to like being noted. All righty then. The, the Finkel vibe and the, yeah. the hello. Like, <laughs> Basemers, you didn't watch Ace Ventura. Right. This is sponsored by... <laughs> I can't uh, do that anymore. <laughs> can't do that anymore. Yeah, so uh, bone marrow transplants, tumors, the whole thing. But here I am, alive. And we're happy that you're and alive. We're yes. happy to have uh, discussions on Basin Nerds about uh, fake nuts. So, I, yeah, I think one. I think the, the growing, the, the trend of this podcast so far, this is, this is our sixth... One that we've yeah, recorded? Yeah, I think so. I think is it's number, number six. six. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Bruce. There you go. Fucking there you go. Jamie, ah. Jimmy, you can't fucking listen to this one. Sorry, turn yeah, it off. It is. Well, uh, Put a disclaimer wow. in there. Sign. Of course it um, is. Daredevil. Yeah, this is six. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Wow. I didn't expect. We've been talking for about two hours now. Yeah, about a buck 45. Bingo. So, uh, you've got. You've got WednesdayNightTitans.com. Are there any other websites that link yeah, to you specifically as, as a musician? Your IG, whatever you want to share. IG is the king's eye. Got it. Um, I have a website, KevinScottMusic.com, that I need to update. I haven't updated in a very long time. WordPress? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You look like a WordPress guy. It's easy. It's easy. I got to figure out an easier way to do it. Squarespace. Squarespace. Yeah, I need to switch it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Wow, that's good. Well, man, Kevin. Thank dude, you so much. It's definitely a pleasure. Absolute laughing pleasure. with you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Me and my wife come to your home this evening for Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl and have delicious food and meet your adorable child. Yeah, he's napping now, sleeping. Oh, full, he's, yeah, full he's sleep out. mode. He's out he does this thing now too. Like you know, he's like rambunctious throughout the day, but then you'll like go and like even if he's being like the biggest asshole that day, like you go and you see him and he's sleeping in bed. And he's just like <laughs> he's like you sleep like this, like a perfect little angel. <laughs> It's like I can't be mad at you for it. I can't be mad at you ever. You're As so he's perfect. putting the pillow over his face, oh, yeah. yeah, can't. Shit. Uh, you don't have children. <laughs> I do not have I'm children. By that. <laughs> I have two <laughs> dogs. Yeah. And uh, I well, listen, I'm sterile now after all that. Uh, I only got one nut, and it ain't working. So I can't have kids anyway. So <laughs> you look so I'm shooting blanks, bro. <laughs> And that's how we end <laughs> episode six <laughs> with Kevin it. King. Uh, All six, right, so yeah, sixth episode. <laughs> uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the Base Nerds uh, on our YouTube, our Instagram, uh, our Facebook page. We just released a bunch of Nam footage. Mm-hmm. This video's been doing really. Did you see this? The Remco. The Remco. Remco shared the video, and it's like blown up. You watched Remco. Remco Hendrix. Uh, he's a dreaded guy who has this really kind of unique thumb pick technique with his fingers that like kind of has a less Claypool vibe yeah. to the way he sounds, huh. but uh, but like really unique and cool. Where's he from? It's like Norway, something like Sweden. He's super one. sweet. I talked to him for like two minutes. Yeah, yeah. So I got some footage of him at. I got footage of everybody. I had the that. Did you see that Ben Lacey footage I put up? Yeah. Guitar player. Great cocktail. Oh, 
dude, guy was killing it. That stuff blew up on like Reddit, and I sent it to Relish Guitars, and they're gonna put upload it directly to their Facebook page. So That's I have cool. a feeling this week it's gonna blow up again. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we got a lot of cool stuff uh, on our Facebook page. Like, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. I'll feed us in. And. <laughs>